and we are live we are live hey happy wednesday everybody welcome welcome pop fly pop shop universe kurt Bavakwa fans thanks for spending this wednesday with us we have live Daniel Jacob Horine, the owner and author and uh, artist of Pop Fly Pop Shop. Say hello, Daniel. Hello, folks. And we have Mr. Dirty himself, Kurt Mavakwa. Say hello to all your fans. Hi, everybody. How you doing today? Now, it's been a while since we've done one of these, so maybe you're new. Uh, what Pop Fly Pop Shop is, is once a week, there is a baseball print. It is a comic book style cover. And is only available for a week, and then it is retired forever. So this week, it is Kurt Vavakwa, the dirty man himself. It is available only on popflypopshot.com. It is retired on Sunday forever. There is an autograph option. Daniel, can you show that cover real quick? You got it. So there it is. Um, dirty Kurt himself. This is only available till Sunday. Go on the website and get it. Get that autograph option. And for our live chat right now, Submit your questions. Daniel is going to bring up first his favorite question, and if that is you, uh, not only will you get your question answered by Kurt, but you will also get a free pot fly. So, uh, Daniel, let's jump right into this print. Um, why Kurt? I mean, there's incredible Hall of Famers like Cal Ripken and Derek Jeter that you have not gotten to yet. So what pulled you into the story of Kurt Bavakwa? Baseball's big. And and this and the story is 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 wide and it's and it's rich and uh, I think that's that's you know the the the, the Kurt, Kurt Bavak was made for made for Popfly project you know it's it's these it's these stories that we don't get to hear enough of and uh, and it's just I I love celebrating those moments and highlighting those moments and and uh, just it's it's you know it's, the performance was super inspiring reminded me a lot of of uh, you know heroes. You know, I, I mentioned earlier in some of the some of the media, the the the, the Batman's, the Iron Iron Man's out there, the the Green Arrows, these 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 humans, you know, faced with an extraordinary moment, you know, rise up to be able to do extraordinary things. So I, I just love that story so much. Now, now, Kurt, my favorite position player of all time was Erstad, and like it wasn't a game unless his jersey was absolutely filthy. And so, talk to us about that style of play that you had and where that nickname came from. Well, I've always loved the moniker because naturally people's minds go to the gutter when they first see it or first hear it, uh, and they don't realize where it started. And uh, it's 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 so I've always gotten a kick out of the fact that um, if something ever went wrong, if there was a slide into second base that was hard, uh, which we used to be able to do, if there was a bowling over of the catcher. Um, or any type of thing like that, I would always hear the chants from the stands. <laughs> oh, that's where you got that nickname. You're dirty. Uh, George Brett even said something after I, him and I got into a little scuffle after I left Kansas City about me being a dirty player, and I've got the name to prove it. Wow. And uh, it's, it's really not true. Uh, I, would, I played hard. Um, and I'm so glad that you asked Daniel that question because I asked myself the same thing. Why me here when he's got the ability to uh, to go out and get Hall of Famers left and right and people that would be interested in this project because his artwork is so great. And uh, I'm, you know, I'm honored to be able to uh, to be on uh, one of the pop fly arts. And it's uh, it's a kick to yeah. answer questions from people. Uh, and that nickname goes back a long way. If you guys want to continue with that uh I'll be happy to, to yes, talk please. about it more. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah tell us well, about it. Pete Rose gave me that nickname, my first major league camp, uh, because I originally signed with the Cincinnati Reds. And when I signed, uh, I took the normal steps that a professional player takes uh, in their advancement through the minor leagues. I played in Tampa, uh, where the Red Spring training facilities were, by the way, back then. Um, I played in Asheville. Uh, and then after my Asheville year and, uh, and also my uh, year in Indianapolis, I got invited to a major league for the first time uh, in 1971. And actually, it was 1970. I'm sorry. And I was a brash 
young player at that time. Uh, and the big red, you, you look out across the field and you see superstars left and right. I mean, we're talking about the big red machine. Yeah. Uh, we're talking about uh, guys that I've had the pleasure of continuing friendships with over the years that uh, uh, for whatever reason, um, that friendship has seemed to last it. Uh, a lot longer than any other teams that I've ever been on. Maybe it's the fact of going through the minor league system with guys. Maybe it's spending as much time as we used to spend together in spring training and being a cohesive type of team that we were and that Sparky Anderson uh, liked to see. But we would go out of our ways in doing everything that we possibly could to make that ball club and to make those teams um, Sparky had older, ex experienced guys that unless you just did something phenomenal, Sparky was going to call you into his office at the end of the spring training, which he did to me on a couple of occasions and say, Kurt, you did everything that we could possibly imagine that you could do, but I've got to go with experience. And I didn't agree with it at the time, especially my second spring. Uh, when I thought I was ready to play in the big leagues and I asked Sparky to be, uh, to be traded. Uh, and lo and behold, three or four weeks later, Bobby Tolan ruptured his Achilles tendon. And I did go to the Cleveland Indians. But before I went, and in all of those days that I was trying to impress uh, to make that Reds ball club, I would come in at the end of the day and I would just be filthy. <laughs> I used the balls. As a matter of fact, Alice Gramis, uh, our infield coach at the time, used to put all the infielders through. When I say all the infielders, all of the infielders that weren't Concepcion or Tommy Helms or Tony Perez or Pete Rose, all of the guys that were trying to impress, I'll put sure. it that way, the guys that were trying to make the ball club. He put us at shortstop, and we had to catch 10 balls before we were allowed to go into the clubhouse and he'd hit him between second and third. Wow. If they, if any one of the balls, the ground balls hit the outfield grass, you had to start over again. So naturally when you get to the seventh, eighth and ninth ground ball, he's going to put him <laughs> just that to where you have to dive for him. Love so it. as dirty as I was, there were quite a few other guys that were just as dirty but my locker was very close to Johnny Benches and Pete Rose's. And I came in after the first few days of spring training. And I mean, I was just covered. Yeah. And it was, uh, it was at that time that Pete said, boy, you're dirty. <laughs> and, and he used a couple of more words in there. <laughs> and, uh, and then the next day, uh, next day I walked in and he goes, Oh, here comes dirty Kurt. Wow. And that was it. Uh, Pete's wife started calling me dirty. Uh, Pete and Johnny Bench referred to me as dirty. Um, George Sugar, one of the coaches on the major league staff, called me dirty. Uh, and he was my manager in Tampa one year. <laughs> and, uh, it, it, and one of my favorite players uh, uh, that I came up through the minor leagues with and that uh, continued on to have a great major league career was Dave Concepcion. Mm. Uh, I kind of took him under my wing in Tampa. You can say I took him under my wing. I really treated him poorly, but we had uh, we had a great time, and he I, I can hear him right now just uh, calling me dirty in that Venezuelan accent that he has. And we, uh, but that that's the story behind it. it. Doesn't have anything to do with fights. It doesn't have anything to do with uh, taking out second basements and shortstops. Uh, in the keystone position with trying to break up double plays or anything like that. It goes all the way back, and it's as simple as going into the locker room with a dirty uniform. You know it's good when a catcher tells you you have a dirty uniform. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. Uh, that's for sure. Daniel, let's show the print again. Show Dirty yeah. Kurt. Um, again, this is only available through popflypopshop.com. Get on there. Uh, get the autograph option. Get your questions submitted in. Uh, now, Daniel, sometimes you choose to have a player's team be like ambiguous mm -hmm. where they're not wearing a specific team. And you chose to just go Padres front and center. Mm -hmm. uh, walk us through your decision to do that. Well, I th for me, it was it was 
the way that you know, Kurt, you're you're tied you're tied to the Padre the Padres franchise. And I know you played for other teams, but but that that moment that I was speaking to that that pinnacle that 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 moment when it mattered, you know, that was that was that was your moment. 80, 84 Padres, you know, I I, I couldn't 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 extract Kirk from that Kirk from that moment at all. And so that, that moment is is his. So it was it was for me just a no brainer. I went straight for the straight for the Padres for that one. How how often, Kurt, does does 1984 get brought up to you when you out hit Tony Gwynn in the World Series? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think uh I don't think Tony Gwynn, you know, having a batting average that was a little higher than uh, T Gwynn's at the time, uh really matters matters and people don't bring that up but i hear uh you know there's conversations of 84 brought into you know into my life almost daily daily uh, it's uh it was a great time um uh, i think it was the start of uh san diego really being a substantial major league town uh in the big leagues i mean they had just come into existence in 1969 uh, as an expansion team, uh, Ray Kroc uh, rescued this ball club from moving to Washington uh, at the last minute uh, when he came in and purchased the ball club for, I think, a measly eight million bucks or something, wow. something like that. It's probably worth a billion and a half or two billion dollars now. But uh, that's that was a pretty good investment for 50 years ago. So it's a lot of money. Um, but it was. Uh, you know, it was a great time, not only for myself, but also for the city of San Diego. I mean, we really came together uh, as a ball club in 1984. And I think the fans of San Diego came together as a base in 1984. And I think it carried on. It carried on throughout the years that they uh, won the National League Championship in 98 and uh, went on to the World Series. Uh, unfortunately, we were defeated by the Yankees, but uh, they met a great team. You know, both of these World Series teams that San Diego has had, uh, and this is not using excuses at all, but we, we've met the Detroit Tigers in 1984 and the New York Yankees in 1998. Those are pretty two damn good ball clubs. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, sometimes you have to take your hat off and, and tip it to the other team. And I think in these instances, even though I thought that we were in a lot of the games uh, that we – uh, that we lost to Detroit in 1984. Uh, we we tipped our hat to that ball club because they had such a great ball club. Yeah. Well, it's funny. Some of the Padres Daniel has done in the past uh, were not on a Padres uniform, like he did Trevor Hoffman and Steve Garvey. And yet, Dirty Frank or uh, Dirty Kurt is the one that is in the Padres uniform. Uh, I do want to ask you some questions about that World Series. Um, you weren't a starter that year. You only started eight games that entire season. Uh, you didn't start through the NLCS. You got some pinch hit appearances. And MLB hasn't always been consistent with the DH in the World Series. Some years it was only the, the AL home team would have the DH. And then at NL Park, right. that year it was the DH every game. So when did you find out you're starting every single game of the World Series? Well, I found out I was starting the first game before the first game. Wow. You know, I never knew. I, I, it wasn't like Dick Williams came to me and said, look, you're going to be the DH every game. Um, you know, I was the DH the first game and hit ninth. So um, I think that it credits the ability of myself to go to the plate in key situations and produce. Uh, and Dick Williams had seen me do that uh, for a number of years because I was I was here in San Diego with him uh, from the first year that he came here in 82, uh, right up through uh, 85 after. And then as soon as Dick was replaced, uh, so was I, but it really didn't have anything to do with Dick, it had everything to do with collusion, but that's for another, another day. The, uh, but the, the DH, role that year um, I think it was earned and I think it was earned because of my ability to go to the plate in key situations later on in the game uh, with Dick calling on me 
and being able to pinch hit and with the game on the line. So I think he knew that I was the type of player uh, that had a chance to produce in those situations. And it turned out that I did. So proves how smart Dick Williams is. Now, was that a game to game, Kurt, where you didn't know if you were starting as DH or did they at some point say, Hey, you're, you're the guy, the whole series. No, never said that. Uh, the, the, uh, I don't like, I don't know if I've ever uh, brought this into the conversation before because I, I did something uh, in game one that is just absolutely a no-no. And it's, I got thrown out at third base with no outs in the seventh inning, leading off the game with a double. Yeah. And I trying to stretch it into a triple and I got thrown out at third. What people don't realize or what is it known is that we had just gone over hitting the ball either into the right field gap or down the right field line and running on Kirk Gibson because he never hit the cutoff man. Uh, I was at a golf funk, uh, a golf event about six or eight months ago and Kirk Gibson and I were talking and uh, he said, you know, that's the only cutoff man I ever hit in my life. <laughs> you know, that's nice of you because it, you know that the score of that game was three to two at the time i let off the seventh inning uh hit hit a ball into the right field corner and if i'm standing on third base with no outs we're probably gonna at least score and tie that game up it could have completely turned yeah. the whole series around as to you know what went on so to be perfectly honest with you, I ended up game one as the GOAT. Mm -hmm. and, and when I left the bar that night, I was some kind of ticked off. I wasn't a happy camper because all the questions were relayed to me. Uh, you know, it was almost like the loss was on me. So I told my wife at the time, I said, you know what? Uh, I'm going to become a key player in this world series. Wow. And I was fortunate enough to start game two. I didn't know that I was going to start game two. Not only did I start game two, but I was moved up in the batting order from ninth to sixth. Yeah. So it was, it was another one of those moves that Dick Williams makes that he's not credited with. Uh, I mean, he got credited with a lot by being elected into the Hall of Fame, but a lot of people didn't like Dick. And I think his demeanor uh, would warrant that in certain situations. But if you look back and any player that I've ever talked to to played for him, he turned out to be the smartest manager I ever played for. Wow. And a lot of guys say the same exact mm -hmm. thing. He had this inner sense about what a guy was going to do or what a guy had the ability to do. And he made sure that he put you in a situation where you could fulfill what you could do to the best of your abilities. Hmm. That man, that's baseball. You, you can't get thrown out at third unless you hit a double. That is so baseball sometimes. <laughs> well, you know, it's not real smart to get thrown out third with no outs or two outs. You, you don't want to in the inning. And you don't want to yeah. get thrown out with no outs because you're in scoring position at second base. And it was an unfortunate deal where uh, I pulled a hamstring run, run, running around second, but it really didn't bother me that much, but it bothered me enough where I had to take a stutter step. And then Kirk Gibson mm -hmm. comes up and fires a perfect throw to Lou Whitaker. And Lou Whitaker later told me that he would have never turned and thrown the ball to third base if it wasn't for the crowd. Wow. He heard the crowd screaming and hollering, and he knew that I was going from second to third when he heard the crowd. And he didn't make any hesitation at all. The uh, cutoff throw was absolutely perfect, and he just turned, whirled it through to third and threw a perfect strike. So I'm out. Now I've got to do my thing. And I yeah. I went out and did it. So it was. Uh, it turned out to be fun. Uh, well, thank you for sharing that story. 
Uh, Daniel, can you show the print again? Show Dirty Kurt. Um, sometimes when you play aggressive and dirty, you, you got to take the good with the bad like there. And I, I'm a fan of make them make two perfect throws and a perfect tag. Uh, I, I live, I can live with that as a fan. I love uh, Daniel. That. I'm, I'm a sorry. Fan of, I'm, I'm a fan of what Daniel wrote on the bottom of this. Uh. <laughs> yeah. Let's talk about that. Daniel, where did you find yeah. that from? And did you, um, go back and forth putting that in there? That, that was that was what what I had heard about kind of where the name came from and I was like this is this is this is too great to leave out so I, I put it in there my my first draft and uh, you know green lights like all right <laughs> I think that probably came from the Lasorda tape somewhere <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure I'm sure it did <laughs> talk about that Dodger beef Kurt where did that come from? Well anytime that uh, anytime that you're playing a team, um, that has had the success that the Los Angeles Dodgers have, um, you're going to try to up your game a little bit. And, and I think it was, that was the situation when I came to San Diego and when anybody uh, played against the Dodgers uh, in, in that, in that time period was they were always the guys that you wanted to try to beat. And, you know, I came here in 79 uh, and played a couple of years before the 82 season when, uh, the incident happened uh, that propelled that Lasorda tape into the news. But um, so we, we had had some pretty good battles with them. And, um, you know, everybody says that it's not a rivalry. I think Dodger fans try to slough it off. That is not a rivalry. Uh, they were talking about it being a rivalry. I'm talking about Dodger players talking about it being a rivalry. So, they can't slough it off as not being a rivalry. And I think it started back in about 82. And, mm -hmm. and that was when um, LaFay got hit in the head after uh, a guy by the name of Broderick Perkins uh, hit a, a go-ahead home run in 10th inning of a game that I had tied um, by hitting a pinch hit double in the eighth inning. And it, uh, it, it was kind of comical the way everything came about and happened uh, with uh, that Lasorda tape because it, it's not like it happened that night. It, that, that video and audio didn't take place until two or three weeks after that night. And it was after the constant prodding of a couple of Tommy's players, Jerry Royce and Jay Johnstone, instigating the whole thing every single day. They, they were, they were two guys that were uh, former teammates of mine and they just, they instigated Tommy every day and they sent in these reporters to make sure that they would catch anything that he might say. And that's how the videotape happened. And then we just kept it on. I mean, I got a kick out of it. I thought it was, <laughs> I thought it was a kick. So mm -hmm. we had a good time with it. And that's why I say that's probably uh, where that little uh, little saying came from, because yeah. he wasn't very nice about anything that he said about me on that tape, which just uh, made it even more of a success as far as I was concerned. <laughs> and he knew who you were, right? Weird Al only does the, the top hits. He doesn't do something that. someone's heard of. <laughs> um, Daniel, where, where no did doubt. you get that quote from? Was that a Tommy quote? No, I from from what I was reading that that uh, Curtin, you can correct me here was was that was that was that Pete's uh, phrase to you when he when he gave you that nickname? It yes, or close to it. <laughs> that, yes, that was uh, yes. <laughs> that's exactly you know that's exactly what he said. Wow. <laughs> He came, I came in the second day, and that's exactly what he said. And then from that, <laughs> I love it. Uh, from well, that day on, uh, I everybody just called me dirty. Or really, Pete and Johnny were the ones that kept it up. The reason these guys were always in the clubhouse when I came in was because they get to go home early. All the star players, you know, play four or five innings in spring training, and then they get relieved by guys like me you know, and Daryl Cheney's and the Tommy Helms and the uh, Ty Klein's of the world and Bernie Carbo and players like that, that were trying to make that ball club. Um, you know, we were always the guys 
is that we're waiting in the wings to go in and replace these guys. And it was, uh, it was at that time that this happened. So it was, uh, you know, it's kind of like the, if you, I know, you know, you had a, a, a pop art in Nolan Ryan. Uh, I re, I remember fate. I, I think I had more at bats against Nolan Ryan early on in my career in nine o'clock games in Cocoa beach than any other time in the big leagues. And I faced him quite often with the angels and when he was with Houston, uh, I didn't face him at all when he was starting with the New York Mets, but it was, uh, it was during those B games when we used to drive from Tampa, Florida to Cocoa beach in the morning at six o'clock to get to Cocoa beach in time to face either J.R. Richards or Larry Durker or Nolan Ryan in a Monday nine o'clock B game. You know, those are the last guys that you want to face nine o'clock <laughs> at night, not just at, nine in at the morning. any hour. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. I mean, it's just brutal. I mean, it's brutal. So Sparky would drag. I tell you what, I got to give those guys credit. Sparky Anderson and his entire coaching staff were always on the bus with us to go to these B games. And it was the B players that were going to these B games. Johnny Bench and Pete Rose and all those guys weren't on this bus with us. Trust me. They were going to be playing in the A game, which wasn't in Coco. The A game was back in Tampa. So we get through playing that B game in Coco Beach we jump on the bus and some of the coaches, I, I remember there were several occasions where Sparky would go back early and he turned the game over to one of the coaches because he had to go and manage the A game in a different location. You don't see that stuff going on now because of the facilities that these guys have now. But uh, I mean, I live four or five blocks away from Miami Stadium growing up as a kid. And they, the Baltimore Orioles had one field to spring train on. And that was Miami Stadium. They didn't have it off fields. They had one field, and it was Miami Stadium. And it was the same way with us in Tampa. We had a little bit of a side field uh, that was kind of like just infield, uh, nothing you could hit on or anything like that. So we had to play as many of these B games as we possibly could in order for Sparky to see certain guys. And I'll tell you what it was mostly. It was for, for the superstar pitchers to get in their work. That was what those B games were really for. All of us thought it was our opportunity to make the team. <laughs> That's bull. <laughs> That's not the way it worked. Hmm. Well, uh, Daniel, can you show the, the cover again? Um, again, this is Dirty Kurt is only available until this Sunday, and then it is retired forever. There was an autograph option. Go to popflypopshop.com. And uh, Daniel, you mentioned that sometimes um, the, the cover can take much longer than others. And this is one that you felt just kind of came out very quick and naturally. Can you share that process with us? Yeah. You know, I, I always love those stories about the, the, the few and far between moments where a musician might say like, oh, I just the song came to me in my sleep. We wrote it. We wrote it and recorded it in 20 minutes. Those moments are so uh, a betrayal to the creative process because that never happens. Uh, the creative process is long and it's difficult and it's messy. And those moments when things come easily and quickly are very few and far between and not at all representative of the, the creative process. However, this one, you know, I sat down to do a, a couple sketches. I was going to shoot them over to Kurt and do this, do this, you know, in a couple weeks. But um, I, I started doing a sketch and I said, oh, I like that. Let me, let me take it a little bit farther. Let me take it a little bit farther. And then just w without even kind of realizing what was happening and, and kind of those those moments where t time is in a vacuum and you don't realize how much time has passed, I have pretty much almost finished piece in, in one sitting. And and those are those are the funnest pop flies. Those are the funnest just artistic experiences, period, when those happen. And so th that's very much what this one was. My full intention was to send Kurt Here's 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 my sketch of where I'm headed, and I ended up sending skirts, uh, sending Kurt. Here's my here's my nearly finished product that I, that I had completed, and so that was just a 
so 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 few and far between those moments are and there's uh, such a blast when they happen mm. now, now kurt did you ever like read comics as a kid are you is what's it like seeing yourself on a cover i think it's it's really really cool it's it's really cool because of what your first question to daniel uh just seeing myself next to guys that i looked up to and that were my peers uh and that i took the field uh, every day, not only looking up to, to him, but trying to beat him. Um, mm. I hope I'm not overstepping here, Daniel, but what I'd like to do with uh, the autograph copies, if anybody is tuning in right now and wants to get one of these uh, pop, uh, pop fly arts, uh, I'll sign it and personalize it if, in fact, you can get that message to me, Daniel. Wow. Uh, if I sign them. So I'll personalize it any which way that you want to. So uh, I like this artwork so much. And I like the project that Daniel's doing with this artwork. Thank uh, you, I'm going to start being a collector myself. <laughs> yeah. Well, those older ones are really pricey. Good luck with that. <laughs> The second hand market. Well, I'll start with mine. I'm going to start with mine. <laughs> the second hand market is not kind to collectors. So you need to buy this one before <laughs> it's retired. And what this reminds me of, Kurt, is like my son's uh, seven. He's a huge baseball fan. And we'll, we'll go see games. And every batter, every pitcher, he'll be like, hey, dad, is this guy really good? Is this guy good? Is this guy good? And I say the same thing every time. Son, he's a major leaguer. So mm -hmm. he's one of the best in the world. There's no such thing as a bad major leaguer. And so, you know, are, are you in the same stratosphere as Tony Gwynn? No, no one would say that. But you're one of the greatest baseball players of all time because you had a long career in the MLB. Uh, Daniel, is there a question from a fan that has really grab, grabbed your eyes? Uh, there, there's a lot of great questions. Um, let's see. Uh you know, so so I'm I'm gonna ask Marcus Lakers question. Mark Mar Marcus is here a lot for these these chats, and I have not asked his questions yet. So I definitely want to ask Marcus. Let's go, Marcus. Marcus question. <laughs> so Marcus asked, "What was the locker room like and and the parking lot leaving the stadium after the epic fight with Atlanta that year?" You know, I don't. Uh, that's a good question, Marcus. I don't recall there being any issues after the last uh, little session that we had in the eighth inning when Donnie Moore uh, hit uh, Greg Nettles, uh, because that was it. Uh, that's when I finally got kicked out of the game. I lasted eight innings. That was pretty good. <laughs> it was, yeah, it was, it was great. I mean, there were guys that got kicked out and let's see, it all started in the, th in the 30 with guys getting ejected. We, we took the field in the first inning when Perez first hit Alan Wiggins, but there, no fights broke out and nothing really happened until the third inning, which was the first time that Pascual Perez came to the plate and he was therefore thrown at because we didn't retaliate against any of the Atlanta players. We were going to wait for Pascual Perez. <laughs> Perimeter Pasquale, another uh, pop fly from the past. Pop fly alumni. Um, if you have, do you have that time was a good question. There were no, there were no, you know, it wasn't like fans were threatening or any, even though they they did threaten from the stands. Uh, I mean, you saw that with the players looking up at the at the dugout and me being stupid and uh, actually jumping up on top of the dugout <laughs> um, when I when I got hit in the head with something, but. Uh, uh, it, it was funny because Chubb Feeney was the president of the National League at that time. And about two or three weeks after this incident in Atlanta, uh, all of these fines were handed down. And um, they were actually paid by the Padre Ball Club. So all the individual players' fines and Dick Williams' fine were paid by Ballard Smith and the San Diego Padres. Wow. A lot of people don't know that. But I about two or three weeks after the fight and everything kind of settled down and it was kind of forgotten because Atlanta had come to San Diego. We had, we had played them again 
and nothing happened. And Pascual Perez pitched against us, by the way, mm. in San Diego. And you know what Dick Williams did? Every single guy that was involved in any scuffle that day was in the lineup against Pascual Perez. Mm. So that was the kind of manager that Dick Williams was. You know yeah. why? Because he knew that if Pascual Perez came inside on anybody, that it was going to happen again. Mm -hmm. And Pascual Perez did not throw a ball on the inside, inside on anybody the whole day. Wow. He was, he was very, very careful. But so that game happened. Uh, and then all of a sudden I get a letter from the National League. It's in my locker when I come in after taking infield one night which they don't do anymore in, big, in the big leagues. And it's from Chubb Feeney. And he goes, I was just looking at the video and noticed something that I didn't see earlier. And your ass, I, I have this letter somewhere, but this is oh. his exact words. Your ass would have been in a lot, lot more trouble if I would have seen this video that <laughs> he saw where I would stands. Uh, after these two guys that threw this milk carton of beer and hit me in the head, uh, coming off the field after the eighth inning scuffle where Donnie Moore hit Greg Nettles. So uh, that's a letter that I still cherish. And uh, <laughs> there were, there's so many great memories uh, of uh, a long career like the one that I had. Yeah. That it, it's just hard to name one. Uh, there's so many great ones. There's so many great teammates. Uh, there's so many friendships that you've made throughout the years uh, and moments in time where even though the night I hit the home run and won the game, uh, that'll stand out as a moment in time for me. But, you know, there was, there was a lot of other ones also naturally not to the magnitude of that because it was the world series. Uh, it was like Garvey the night he hit the home run off of Lee Smith uh, in the fourth game in the playoffs and, and made game five happen, which we also won and won the national league championship. That I think that's a moment in time that's always going to live and stand out in Steve Garvey's life. Uh, and it should, I mean, Steve, Steve Garvey was the man that night. If it wasn't for Steve Garvey, we don't win the National League Championship. That's all there is to it. I mean, he took over in game four. Um, he led us to victory in that game. And he hits a home run off of Lee Smith, who nobody wanted to face. Nope. I can tell you that. This guy's six foot eight and throws gas. Nobody wanted any part of him. And what does Steve do? He takes a high outside fastball and hits it over the right center field fence after getting hits in every at bat leading up until that point. So that was a Steve Garvey game. Uh, it was a San Diego experience and it was, uh, it was something that, you know, we'll always remember. Wow. Well done, Marcus. Good question. Yeah, thank yeah, you. Marcus. There's a lot, lot of activity in the chat. If you have time for a few more questions, Kurt, sure, is that okay? Absolutely. Let's All right, do I'm it. Gonna look I'm going to grab another question, but, but uh, Henry says he loves the way dirty Kurt talks, gives him, gives him the baseball warm and fuzzies. Well, thank you, Henry. I appreciate that. I also like the fact that you've got a picture of Mickey Mantle in your, uh, if, if you, if you can put, there you go. You see that guy right there. He was absolutely my idol mm. growing up. And when I was about a, a 10, 11 and 12 years old, what I used to do is shag home run balls in Miami stadium and earn my way into the game. If I, if we got two balls, we could earn our way in. <laughs> and, yeah, exactly. I used to have to, I used to have to beat the big guys. And the, the only way I could do it was when cars started pulling into the parking lot. If nobody caught the fly ball or the home run in the air, it would roll under the cars. I was able to get the balls then because the big, the kids were bigger and I wasn't able to out maneuver them. So I, I earned my way in to the, to the, the ball games, and then uh, after a while, somebody said, "You know, we need a bat boy today." Wow! And I, I, I was a bat boy for the visiting team. Wow! And they asked me to be the bat boy for the next game that the Baltimore Orioles were playing the New York Yankees. 
And I'll never forget being a young boy and, and having the clubhouse manager say to us, there were a couple of us, that we had to go out and meet the team and get their bats and equipment from underneath the bus. I went out with the other guys and the equipment manager, and we're waiting for the Yankee bus to pull up, and it does. And the first player off the bus and the second player off the bus was number seven and number nine in 1961. Wow. And I'll never forget that as long as I live. Uh, and, you know, I've got pictures uh, with Mickey, um, uh, not only playing in his golf tournament in Joplin, but also uh, playing in the Yankee Greats uh, Invitational that I had the opportunity to play in. Uh, uh, but uh, I have a, a picture when I was with the Texas Rangers of me and Mickey Mantle on the top step of the Ranger dugout uh, when he was there one day. And being a kid that idolized somebody and that your whole w world revolved around them or what they did, them and what they did, and then having the opportunity to not only meet him, but have him holler down from his house one day, hey, Kurt, I'm glad you came to my tournament. Wow. Uh, there's there's nothing in the world that can beat things like that. And uh, that was an opportunity that I had. And, uh, you know, it. I've got a lot to be thankful for and to look back on. And uh, Dirty Kurt and Pop Fly Art, one of them. Yeah. So, well, I'm that's the equivalent of Daniel doing uh, a Pop Fly of Del Murphy. For him, that's his experience. Yeah. His, Del Murphy was, was a, such a What a great guy and what a great ball player, also. He should maybe be in the Hall of Fame. This, this, he's, he's on the ballot. He's on the ballot this year. So, so, you know, fingers crossed. And um, yeah, him and Fred McGriff, yes. Yeah. For, oh, yeah. Fred McGriff. I know he's Atlanta Brave. I know and, and McGriff too, but but those those guys deserve it. And uh, H Henry has has more in common with you. He says I, I have a son named Mickey. So Henry Henry was a big fan like you growing up. It looks yeah, like I can see that. Story. There you go. Right. Now I've I've got another question for you, Kurt. And full disclosure, this comes from my wife, but I but I but and she likes to ask this question, and I love it. Um, she says, "Hi, Kurt. Mrs. Potfly here. If you could choose your legacy, what would you want to be remembered for?" You know, I, I've i never been asked that question before. Thank you. Um, I would want uh, people just to remember me as somebody that was uh, grateful for everything that they got, mm -hmm. everything that they, although I look back on my career and I say something that sounds very selfish when it comes out at the beginning, that I don't know baseball or anything, because I worked really hard for everything that I got in the game. So even though I'm grateful for the game of baseball, I don't really feel like I owe the game of baseball anything. And I don't feel like the game of baseball owes me anything. But I think it's to be, kind, be, be known as being kind to the fans mm -hmm. and that any opportunity that I ever had to make somebody happy, um, that I took that opportunity and, and went forward with it. So I, I think that's something that's very important to me. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, you, you've made me happy working with me on this piece and wow. you made a lot of fans happy. So I, I really appreciate that. And I want to say, too, the way you spoke about Mickey Mantle, it's, it's resonated with a lot of people in the chat, too. They're saying this is one of the best interviews yet. But the way you spoke about Mickey Mantle, you know, that, that, that feels like that gets to the heart of what I'm hoping to do with this whole project is like in the end, we're all still 10 year olds with a lot yep. of decades of experience. And we still look at the Mickey Mantles and the Dale Murphys and the Kurt Bavakwas of our, with those 10 year old eyes, those wide inspired eyes, you know, and that, that's what I want to do with this project is, 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 is go back to that 10 year old, you know, looking up at these larger than life players and, and, and draw them how, how they felt like to us when we were kids. Yeah. So well, thank hey, you. Don't, don't feel like, don't feel like you're alone. Um, the guys, that you would think uh, would just take it with a grain of salt. Uh, we're in locker rooms and we're looking across the room and we're going, you got to be kidding me. I'm sitting in, <laughs> I'm sitting in this room, leaning back on this chair, 
looking across. I mean, Mickey or uh, Henry Aaron's locker was right next to mine in Milwaukee. Um, wow. You know, I, I look back. I don't know why I wasn't taught to be a thief. <laughs> if I would have stolen, body gloves and if I was stolen <laughs> things that I had the opportunity to steal, yeah. uh, I would have been a multimillionaire at this time. I mean, there would there would have been nothing that would have been holding me back. I would have had my own yacht, my own plane, uh, just with the memorabilia and the things <laughs> that. Uh, uh, you know, the people that were still in the game when I first started that were at the end of their career. Um, pitching coach, I mean, Warren Spahn was our pitching coach in Cleveland wow. when I um, wow. was left-handers of all time. Uh, you know, Sandy Koufax was still around and, uh, and uh, being a player that uh, went through spring training in Florida, my – you know, the first half of my entire career, I didn't know Arizona existed. Uh, and now you got 15 teams in Florida and 15 teams in Arizona, and you've got the most beautiful facilities that you've ever seen, uh, not only for the fans, but also for the players. I mean, these guys are spoiled. Are you kidding me with these fields that they have to play on now? You don't see a bad hop any hardly anymore. Ever. You remember Tony Kubek getting hit in the throat mm -hmm. during the World Series one time? A lot of you guys I, I know are still young. Evan's just sitting there going, what the hell is he talking about? <laughs> Evan, he took a bad hop ground ball in the throat and had to be removed Wow. from the game. But that's the way fields were. When we went to Atlanta, all due respect, Fulton County Stadium, none of us would take infield. We didn't want to take a chance on getting nailed in the face with a ground ball because the infield was so bad. I'm surprised there weren't gopher holes on that infield. <laughs> it was so bad. But the facilities that these guys have nowadays, the facilities that the fans can go to and enjoy the game, hey, guys, I know that the game has changed a lot. And we all talk about it on a daily basis. But you know what? When you get down to it and push comes to shove, it's still baseball. Mm -hmm. It's still baseball. And you know what? The longer it takes to play a baseball game, I'm all for it. Yeah. Yep. I'm not in a rush. Yeah. No, I'm not either. I'm not either. Not at all. Well, uh, Kurt, before we let you go, can you share about uh, Dirty Kirk's Dugout? I want to make sure everyone hears what that is. <clears throat> well, sure. It's a podcast that I do live. Uh, and uh, for the first month or month and a half after uh, the World Series ends, uh, I kind of take a hiatus, but I do do live Facebook uh, posts. So I'll be going on tomorrow with 315 live on Facebook uh, and chatting about whatever it is that tickles my fancy that particular day. Most of the yeah. time it's baseball. Now it's baseball all the time. Trust me. But it, tomorrow I'm actually going to talk about the Houston Astros. Hmm. Uh, it, it's very seldom where I get on and just talk about one subject. But tomorrow I'm going to talk about the Houston Astros. You know why? This is a great ball club. Mm -hmm. There's been a lot of strange things that have happened with the Houston Astros since the season ended. Mm -hmm. And we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about why. And I'm going to tell you some inside stuff that a lot of other people don't know about. There's a lot of speculation about it. But I'm going to tell you about it tomorrow on my live show. Oh, cool. How's that for a tease? That, you know what? I have questions. A team wins the World Series and they start firing extremely high-ranking position people. I, so I'm ready to tune in. Yeah, um, me too. Man, Dirty Kirk, thank you for just the fun of your career. You never just gave the standard one game at a time. I respect the other, blah, blah, blah. You, you spoke with a passion. You played with a passion. Mm -hmm. You gave us uh, memories. Thank you for this experience. You just gave us 50 minutes, two schmucks like Daniel and myself. Um, thank you for doing that. And the, the autograph options. Uh, go to potflypopshot.com. This is only available until this Sunday. Get an autograph option. And, man, you can stick this thing in between your Steve Garvey, in between the perimeter Pasquale. That's the perfect book and a word. Oh, of I love that. Yep. I love it. 
uh, thank you so much. Uh, go to Dirty Kirk's dugout and hear some of him, hear more of him talking about baseball if you enjoyed this time. Uh, thank you, Kurt. Daniel, can you stick around? Sure, no problem. Kurt, thank you. What's thank your, you. your last word for your fans, Kurt? Thank you. I've got, I've got a great idea based on what Evan just said. Okay. I want to join the two of you. We've got a new pop fly called the Three Schmucks. <laughs> <laughs> I've been preparing for that pop fly for over 40 years. <laughs> hey, guys, right. thank you very much. It was great talking to you, and let's just do it again. All right. Sounds great. Thank, thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. And everybody, get your orders in. we got to get this thing going. All right. Thank and, you. Daniel, can you say goodbye to him as a former Texas Ranger in your best Hank Hill voice, please? You mean former Texas Ranger third baseman, Kurt Bavakwa? Uh, <laughs> That was on the that spot. Sounds like the yeah, King, of the Hill, King of the Hill episode. Yes. Yeah. That, right. that, there's, there's a little Kurt, illusion. Yeah. Thank right. you, Kurt. Thank you. Talk All right. to you soon. Yeah. Uh, you're not a schmuck. I'm the schmuck. I just no, no. said <laughs> wonderful artist and his friend, the schmuck. <laughs> no, no. Um, well, Daniel, it's been a while since we've done this. Months. Mm hmm. Since, um, I was looking back. It's been since July with uh, Tony Oliva was the last time I got to speak. Tony Oliva, man. Since then, you've had a run of Topps cards, mm -hmm. and you've had a lot of sort of um, behind-the-scenes shifts in Pop Fly and production and printing. Can you can you just give us all an update on Pop Fly Universe and what's happening? Yeah, it's been, it's been a wild journey. We had uh, a good amount of delays for quite quite some time. Uh, it, Potfly has not been immune to supply chain issues, and and uh, but ultimately, I think the good thing that came out of it is, um, and I sent this, I sent an email out, and you know, here's here's a good spot to say it. Um, I think what was born out of out of that difficult difficulty was, you know, upgraded upgraded uh, print quality. We've got we've got different better paper, better paper, thicker paper. Um, our, our printing times, our shipping times have, have been reduced to we're finally fine. And this is the palms up. Thank you, Jesus moment, you know, working with the fulfillment center to get these out, you know, up for the last two and a half years, this has been, uh, my wife and I doing uh, a good chunk of the fulfillment ourselves and, uh, doing being, being, being the CEO of a company and, and the janitor and everything else in between. So it's yeah. been it's been a lot. So it was a long time coming, but but I think this this moment kind of forced us to do something that we have been meaning to do and wanting to do for a long time. So in addition to the to the you know better quality, faster prints, fulfillment center to get things out quicker. Um, so all, all good things and every, getting caught up, but all, all good things from from this kind of mm. uncomfortable moment that we've had during the summertime. Let me reflect on this. And just so everyone, I'm not a pot fly employee. Okay. I just ride this guy's cape so I can talk to baseball players. It's great. Um, but almost, you remind me of Kurt. Like Kurt doesn't get thrown out at third unless he hits a double in the mm -hmm. gap. So pot fly doesn't get backlogged with 9,000 prints unless they sell 9,000 prints. And so it's sort of the irony of there's a lot of artists out there that wish they had problems like getting backlogged, but they're not selling 9,000 mm -hmm. prints. And so with success, it sounds like you guys have been forced, which is a blessing to, Hey, how do we scale this? How do we print more than maybe we, the first print you sold 12. That's a, <laughs> I think it was less than that, but yeah. <laughs> so that it's a blessing of you having to deal with success. Mm -hmm. and, and if I could talk to the consumers as I'm one of you, Look, I, we live in an Amazon world where you buy some thing off of Amazon and you get it the same day sometimes. Mm -hmm. So I get the you buy a pot fly print and you're not getting it for a month. And maybe there's some frustrations there, but you're not helping Jeff Bezos go to outer space here. OK, we are supporting a, a local mom and pop family business. This this is how they pay their their mortgage, their food. And uh, with good things, take it needs patience. So I applaud Popfly for reconfiguring the system and, and getting it oiled a little bit a little bit better. And I think we understand like, hey, there's a lot of success. And with that comes growing pains a little bit. Yeah, I you know, I, the, the, by no means am I complaining at all. You know, this is I've just 
I very much resonate with Kurt. You know, you compared me to Kurt, and I'll 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 take it. You know, very very grateful to 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 be to be in the spot that I have to figure out these these things. You know, I've I've been. You know, like you said, we sold sold eleven or twelve our first one, and that and and I was so happy for those eleven and twelve, and and that that meant a lot to me. You know, and I'm and I'm still still happy for every single one, and so grateful. And and the the I think because the road to this point has been so arduous and challenging, I'm I'm grateful for it because it's not like I just flipped a switch and like things are great. You know, it's, it's a long, it's been a long journey. And so I think that's made, made, made any success, any success, just full of, full of gratitude for my wife and I, mm. and, and, and my, 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 my wife uh, is comment left a comment here and I'm going to, I'm going to show it up here. She said, thank you for highlighting these points. We have an amazing community who has been so gracious and understanding as we grow and maneuver. And I'm going to plus one plus two and plus three that, um, just the pot fly collecting community, the community that's been built around collecting these things has been an absolute highlight of this whole, um, experience so far the last two and a half years and, and, and never found a more lovely, altruistic, kind corner of the internet as I have with that group. And, and, uh, it's completely, completely grateful for it. And, uh, it's a, it's a treasured, treasured thing. And I am honored to be a part of it. And as is my wife. Yeah. Well, we love the transparency from you guys. If there's a, a printing problem, you just straight out say, Hey, there's a printing problem. And you know what? We're shifting printers. And mm -hmm. so, um, you know, honesty goes a long way. Uh, can you reflect on just the tops project as well? Uh, just what's, what was that like as uh, you and I bought tops cards as a mm -hmm. kid? We'd open packs together in in a in a boat <laughs> in a garage. What was it like seeing your stuff with that Tops logo on the card? Absolutely surreal. Like I feel very much. It's hard. It's hard to say. For a few things. First of all, I feel very much a part of the community that collects these things. I'm, you know, it's, I still feel like, whoa, that's really cool. I'm still very much excited by it, and and I'm I'm watching in awe as well about you know the stuff that's that's happened and gone on, and and I and I think about you a lot. I think about you and and collecting cards in your room or in that hot boat in my parents' backyard <laughs> um, with bees bees <laughs> entering in that boat. Anyway, but that that's how that's how we cut our teeth in baseball, you and I, and and a lot of kids here. Um, kids grow kids with decades of experience i mean um collecting collecting cards and tops was tops was like the card you know yeah. there was there was donris and fleer and score and then there's tops at the top and uh to be a part of that legacy was absolutely like it's it's just surreal and 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 i had the opportunity to create par parallel cards Every artist had had an opportunity to make parallel cards um, for their releases, and so um, for those parallel cards, you know, I think the 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 thing the the logical thing to do is like add a foil or change the color, or do this. But I, I said, here's my moment. I have a moment to do five tops cards, and if I can sneak in alternate artwork and let that be my parallel, I'm going to make 10 cards for tops if I can make 10 cards. Yeah. So, so I just wanted to squeeze as much, um, just as much from the moment as possible, because, you know, you, you never know what tomorrow brings here. Here's my moments. And so I, I enjoyed every second of it. It's still absolutely surreal. Um, and just honored, honored by the, um, yeah, honored by the, by the opportunity. Yeah, I'd say screw you, Popfly fans, because you made those sell out in like eight seconds. <laughs> you broke top hands on all of them. But uh, man, that, that Julio Rodriguez, who is now confirmed Rookie of the Year, mm -hmm. that's one of my favorite cards of all time. The thank you the signal in the background on the um, the the Seattle built the Space Needle. Yeah, yeah. thanks. I, I'm really I'm glad for that one for several reasons. Glad glad that. Uh, you know, it's his rookie card. It's got the Tops RC label on it, so that was his rookie, rookie card. And he's going to spend a long time in Seattle too. It was so because you never know. Like we, we did Mackenzie Gore, and, and he was he was when, when it when when the week started. He it was uh, in San Diego when it ended. <laughs> and, 
but but I, I'm glad to have not only a, a, a Seattle piece for Rodriguez, but also have it iconic for the city, like ha have the piece married to the city because like, like, like Gotham is just as much a part of Batman's story as any villain or hero or and Metropolis is just as, you know, with Superman, I, f I feel like the city, especially with these career players, like the Chipper Jones is out there and, and um, that just spend a career with one team. You know, I feel like the city is just as much a character in their mm. career you know, as, as Gotham is for Batman. Yeah. Everything about that story. I mean, him doing what he did at the home run derby as this like coming out party. I was there. You were there. <laughs> um, I know one schmuck voter. I'm saying schmuck a lot. One guy voted for the catcher from the Orioles. I don't know how in the world, but he should have been unanimous rookie of the year. Um, and I'm a, as an angels fan, it pains me, but uh, what a great player that kid is and commemorated perfectly by you. And I remember you talking about what rookies you were thinking about doing. And mm -hmm. um, and when you decided, Julio wasn't the clear-cut guy. Mm -hmm. And so that was you having your finger on the pulse of baseball. So well done. And Thank you. Another rookie who I will not re-mention fell off the planet, who at that time you were like, oh, he was one of the guys you were talking about. And um, you, you went well with Julio. It was, it was hard. Yeah, that, was, that was one of the things for the, for the project is that – I, you know, I needed to do a rookie, but that's, I always go back to Dodge, Todd Van Poppel. You know, I, I'm, I'm a, I, I just remember how big Todd Van Poppel was and Kevin Moss, like he was the next big thing. And then by the time the season was over, it was over, you know? And so, so I have to pick a rookie or two rookies. You know, I, I, I want to be as thoughtful as I could for, for those ones. So I'm really glad that who it looks like Julio has a very rich, uh, Oh, legacy man. ahead of them a lot of junk rookie cards out there <laughs> they can't miss and that that's what we're talking baseball now like i'm a fan of man you got some rookies trade them for the stud i'm so not the hoard your prospects kind of fan mm -hmm. i just i know i've just seen it too many times that the can't miss guys they seem to miss <laughs> quite a bit um it was fun talking to kurt about the dodger thing uh again more baseball talk I, I'm not a Dodgers nor a Padres fan, but it was nice seeing the Dodgers. I mean, the Padres get sort of a, a punch in on the Dodgers this year. Mm -hmm. It was nice to see them to sort of push back. Um, didn't get a flag. They, <laughs> yeah. they didn't win the NL or anything. They didn't win the West. So they yeah. didn't, but they got some bragging rights in that rivalry. They did. And they did it. They did it without one of their stars too. Yeah, that's. We'll see next year with the same team and add Tatis to the mix. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll see how that goes. Um, some rumblings on it was, was that extension looked like the greatest extension ever. And now as some people were kind of wondering how, mm -hmm. how's that Tatis contract going to play out, but we mm -hmm. are in free agency. We're 89 days away from when pitchers and catchers report, you can log on to dirty Kirk's dugout tomorrow and see I'm, what he's going to say about the Astros. Any, any thoughts for free agency or the Braves or the Dodgers or anything you're looking at this offseason, Daniel? No, I, I am I am in full pot fly mode. I, I am unaware of uh, a lot of the comings and goings uh, in free agency at the moment. So one of these days I'll, you know, we, we did our uh, we did our fantasy baseball league, you and I, and I pretty much started it, started it and let it run on auto for the entire for the entire year. So uh yeah, no, no idea. That, that, that's very representative of how I'm at, at the moment, just kind of get, getting through things. I did take second, by the way, in that fantasy league. Got I took second from the bottom, I think. <laughs> now, the finals championship week, I stopped checking it by Tuesday. That's how bad it was. In the it was so bad. I'm like, I'm done. I, it's too painful to watch. Uh, um, and any form, just party words that you want us to know about Pop Fly going forward? Anything coming up? Um, no, nothing's particular other than just, you know, we, we are, we, we, we made a lot of process improvements, looking forward to hearing your feedback of, of how, how that's go, going. Um, and, uh, just, you're, you're just, yeah, would lo love, love to hear. We always, always have our ear, ear on the tracks, you know, list, listening to, and, and responding to feedback, always want to do things better and, and always, always, always super grateful for the support. You know, this, the fact that I get to do this for a living is just it truly is a dream come true and and that is that is because of the support of the community that, that collects these pieces and and to be an, to be an artist 
uh, making work that people collect is 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 just an, a full stop honor to be to be able to to make the art that you want to make and people collect it and be able to do that for a living that is extremely rare and I count my blessings twice every day for for this. Well, speaking of that, let's show the print one more time before we sign off. Go to potflypopshop.com. This is only available until Sunday. Get your Dirty Kirk. You can put them next to Steve Garvey, Tony Gwynn. I never heard the Perimeter Pasquale stuff. That's phenomenal. Mm -hmm. um, maybe, Daniel, you can can you readdress later? Kurt had a generous offer of personalizing. I have no idea if that's even feasible. If, if it's not, like that's just a, a nice gesture mm -hmm. that he would even make instead of just blowing through those things. Um, I'll let you readdress the Pop Fly universe at another time if that's possible to have him personally addressed or not. But get yours um, by Sunday, either the raw copy or get it autographed. Um, hey, thanks for joining us for this hour and five minutes on a Wednesday. It made my day fun. Yeah, mine too as well. Th th yeah, thank you so much. And that was a super generous offer for Kurt. Uh, for, and uh, I'll, I'll post some details uh, as we figure them out on, on kind of what's going on with that. All right. Welcome to the hot stove. Keep watching. <laughs> See you guys all later. See y'all. Thank you.